Hey friends, this is Sarah. And this is Ashley. And this is Hometown Homicide. Today, I am going to tell Ashley the story of what has been referenced as the Wichita Massacre. Mm -hmm. It is particularly brutal. Something we didn't do with the last one is listener discretion is advised because there's talk of murder and rape and a little bit of animal cruelty. So, I know. No. So, uh, FYI... There's that. It's it's brief, but it is in there. So, Reginald Carr, C A R R. Yes, that is how it is said. Was born in 1978. I couldn't find an actual birth date, which annoyed me. But in Dodge City, Kansas, and his little brother Jonathan was born two years later in 1980. Um, that was about the most innocent they were at birth because through their childhood and formidable years was bad news bears. Uh, their parents fought and were abusive. Their father even uh, would sexually abuse their older sister. So that's great. And then eventually their parents divorced. Father abandoned the family. But mom fell back into those type of relationships. And their stepfather would also sexually abuse their sister. And you know, all that. Pattern. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes their mother, Janice, even when she was uh, punishing them for things, she would have the children strip naked, have the other kids hold them down while she whipped them with electrical cords or belts. Uh, sometimes the boys would go to their maternal grandmother's house, but that wasn't much better, apparently, because she would have sudden outbursts of rage as well comes from somewhere, and that would be where. The apple didn't fall too far from the tree, Not that's far, how they say it. Not far at all. Oh, that same stepfather even at one point put a gun to her head, uh, to their mother's head, just like that kind of violent abuse in like the in home. Like in front of the kids? I mean, it didn't say, but just even bringing weapons into it makes it a whole other level. Uh, of just grossness. Another another level of grossness is Reginald, apparently as young as six years old, was starting to explore sexually and was reported to have fondled some of the young girls that their mother would babysit. How old At was he? Six. Six? Six. Jeez. Yeah. Hmm. In their trial... It was quoted that Reginald Carr's moral development was stunted and that children exposed to early sexual activity often have impaired sexual control and are aroused by deviant sexual behavior. Which is pretty key here. They were also drinking and using drugs at a young age because it was also around in the home. Marijuana and cocaine. Reginald at was- At what age? Oh, hold on. Oh, okay. Reginald was dealing drugs by the age of 13, including to his own mother. What? <laughs> right? Like, you're 13 and dealing drugs to your mom? Yeah. Let's keep it in-house, man. I mean, I didn't even know what drugs were at 13. I, mean, I was very naive. I, I So was I. I Small mean, towns. Su- Hashtag. Super naive. At 13, though, I was even more naive. Yeah. Um, as they grew into their teens, uh, they just kept going in a downward spiral. Reginald, the older brother, uh, did poorly in school and would be in fights. He was suspended in the eighth grade for sexually harassing a teacher, which is just not goals. Um, and then beat up a teacher the next year. He earned 21 detentions and suspensions that freshman year and then (laughs) dropped out before they could kick him out. Wow. Um, Fights and things like that. Violence of sorts was fun for them because apparently they loved shooting their BB guns so much that when they couldn't find animals to shoot, they would shoot each other. 
Jesus. I don't know if I, yeah. Um, Jonathan did at one point when he was 16 drink antifreeze trying to kill himself, which failed. I mean, not that that's a good thing that he failed, but it could have saved some stuff later, but. Uh, Was it meant to be? Yeah. At some point, the brothers relocated to Wichita. I didn't, I couldn't find specifically when. It's like two hours between Dodge City where they were born and Wichita, because so I looked it up. I was curious. Um, but they had already started their own lengthy criminal records. Uh, not a lot was available for Jonathan Cars, because most of it would have been when he was a juvenile. Um, but some of Reginald's crimes already at this point um, would thin the two-year span of 1995 through 1996. <laughs> Reginald, I shouldn't laugh, but Reginald Carr was convicted of theft, aggravated assault, subverting the legal process, and a drug charge, and probably some other stuff, but resulting in a total of 53 months of sentences combined. Okay. Just for the activities he was convicted of in two years. And how old was he at this point? Um, he would have... Well, nerp. When did I say he was born? In 78. So he was 20. On, or okay. no, not even. 18. So, real solid. Uh, and then after the 53 months, he was granted parole on March 28th, 2000. But by the end of November... The same year, he was booked for drunk driving, and then separately for forgery and parole violation. You know, he just liked to fuck shit up all the time. Classic shitbag? Uh, yep, classic shitbag. That was... Mm, that was by the end of November. So on December 5th of 2000, police made a very big mistake and let him out six months early. Yeah. Which brings us to where this story of terror and tragedy truly begins. So on December 5th is when they let him out early. Two days later, on December 7th in East Wichita, a 23-year-old Andrew Schreiber, who was an assistant baseball coach at Newman University, stopped at a come-and-go convenience store so if you're not from around Midwest, that is like a Casey's or I guess that's Midwest too. Quick is, Star, Fast Fuel. I don't know I, what is come and go mainly in the Midwest I don't or know. are they national? I don't, I don't know. know. I couldn't even tell you one that's not from the Midwest. I can't even. Casey's for sure is a very Midwest. Yeah. If you are not from the Midwest, you probably don't know what Casey's is. You don't know what you're missing. But if you are from the Midwest and familiar with Casey's, let us know what your favorite <laughs> breakfast pizza is. That your the favorite? Veggie's really good. It's just mm. not very often in the little carousel. Taco pizza. I mean, Casey's yeah, they're, taco they're pizza. Casey's taco pizza is bomb diggity. But if you're from the Midwest, you, you understand. So let us yes. know. Tell us on social media. <laughs> Hashtag corn. Hashtag corn. <laughs> um, but he's not Hashtag the... bush light. <laughs> <laughs> Iowa water. <laughs> um, he stopped at a come and go convenience store. And as he was coming out of the store, Reginald, who was at 22 at this time, and Jonathan, who would be 20, carjacked Andrew at gunpoint. The brothers made him drive around and withdraw money from multiple ATMs, draining as much as he could from his account. Andrew was quoted as saying... I was just hoping if I did what they said, they'd let me live. Reginald and Jonathan then split up so one could follow in another car as they forced Andrew to drive to a field northeast of town. There, they pistol whipped Andrew and left him on the ground outside of his car and then shot out his tires so when he was able to try to leave, like he couldn't follow or whatever, and, and then he fled in the other vehicle. Four days later, on December 11th, 55-year-old Linda Ann Walenta, a librarian and a cellist in the Wichita Symphony Orchestra, Aww. arrived home in her driveway in suburban East Wichita. She remained seated in her SUV, uneasy because she had noticed that someone was following her when she was on her way home. 
um, and like actually either blocked the end of her driveway or like pulled in behind her um, and she saw one a man approaching her SUV so she put down her window a little bit so she could hear what he was saying uh, what she didn't know was that they decided that they should steal a large SUV so when they had more victims that they could drive around to different ATMs they could like hide the gunpoint part of it like in a big SUV as opposed to like a little car. I don't know. That was their thinking. So they were after her to get her SUV. When she put the window down, that like cracked it a little bit. One of the brothers, it doesn't say whom, and they, they never admitted to which one, I guess, because I couldn't find which one specifically, put a gun sideways in the window and shot at her several times as she sat in her driver's seat. She did attempt to drive away and the brothers fled. Linda initially survived her wounds, but was paralyzed from the waist down. Oh. She aided the police in their investigation by identifying both Carr brothers, eventually, um, in a lineup, but unfortunately she did die from her injuries three weeks later on January 2nd, 2001. Oh. She was only 55. And what about the other dude? He survived. Yeah, he was, I mean, injured, but okay. fine. Did he um, help? anything or yes okay. yes he comes back a little bit later uh, the peak of Reginald and Jonathan Carr's crime spree started on the evening of Thursday December 14th 2000 fueled by a violent desire they chose a house at random and decided whoever was in there was gonna be their next robbery victims so, so they just did stuff by random it wasn't like like targeted it was like oh here's a house let's go there yeah um it, it all seemed to be about money and stuff at first and i don't know what changed their minds at this house but they went very much beyond robbery um in this particular home which was a like a three-bedroom condo there's three friends um, jason befort who's 26 a science teacher and coach uh, apparently of football and basketball or baseball and basketball I can't remember which. something with a ball balls balls mm. balls coach at Augusta High School Bradley Haka 27 a director for finance with the Coke financial services and Aaron Sander 29 a former Coke employee which by the way Coke K O C H Coke you're like wondering Coke what like not uh, coca-cola or anything funky um i was thinking more like coke brothers because that's i think how you spell it i think that's a thing i don't know like from around here the fighters no i thought there was a company oh mm, that i couldn't tell you i don't know i could be making shit up in my head too <laughs> um, but a former coke employee but recently at the time obviously began studying for the priesthood mm -hmm. um and they had all gone to college together. That's how they knew each other. A um, 25 year old teacher who is referred to as HG, so just by her initials, in everything. I saw a first name in one thing, but I'm not going to use it. Um, HG was dating Jason Befort, the science teacher and coach. Uh, she arrived at approximately 8 30 to hang out with the friends and spend the night. She brought along her miniature schnauzer named Nikki, who was also welcomed in the home. I have a feeling where this is going. <sighs> Jason wasn't home quite yet because he was at basketball practice. I knew basketball was one of them. Um, shortly after HG and Nikki's arrival, another woman joined them at the home. Her name was Heather Muller, a 25-year-old graduate student at Wichita State University, who also worked as a church preschool teacher at St. Thomas Aquinas, and who also planned on becoming a nun. Oh. All very nice, wholesome, lovely people here. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and she was actually a former girlfriend of Aaron Sander, the one that wants to be a priest. So they must have like that whole religion thing that, you know, they kind of bonded on. Um, former girlfriend of his, but they remained friends. Uh, they all watched some TV together for a little while before retreating to various bedrooms or other sleeping arrangements. It was reported that 
Heather actually went to Aaron's room to sleep, but Aaron slept on the couch, gave her the room. Bradley went to his room in the basement. Becoming a nun, I'm sure that stuff can't be happening. Yeah. And so. he was nice and was like, yeah, yo, go sleep in my bed. Gentlemanly. Mm -hmm. um, HG was in Jason's main floor bedroom, watching a little more TV while she graded some papers. Uh, he came, Jason came home from coaching basketball practice at about 9.15, and a little later at 10 p.m., HG decided she was going to go to bed. Um, before joining her, he uh, went around the house, make sure all the lights were off and everything, and doors were locked. So just past 11 o'clock, um, Jason, he was still awake and was surprised when the porch light came on, so his bedroom window must have been on the front of the house. And then HG said that she was awakened by shouting and someone kicking in the bedroom door. The man that kicked Jason's bedroom door in was later identified as Jonathan Carr. Uh, he ripped the covers off of the bed. I don't really know the purpose of that besides the shock factor. Like, you're not going to well, hide people underneath the covers. You said he walked around the house to make sure the doors were locked, so... I'll get to my theory okay. on that here in a minute. Um because my next sentence was no one is sure how Reginald and Jonathan gained entry to the home. But my guess is since Aaron was sleeping in the living room on the couch, maybe they knocked or whatever and like stirred him awake and like he groggily like went to the door to see what was up and they might yeah. have pretended they needed help or pointed their guns at him because they did both have guns. So they did gain entry into the home. So HG said just after Jonathan ripped off the bed sheets. Another man, who was obviously Reginald, brought Aaron in from the living room at gunpoint. So that's why I think they probably just forced their way in with guns after knocking or whatnot. Yeah. Um, threw Aaron onto the top of their bed. The brothers then demanded to know who else was in the house. So of course they were scared and told him, hey, there's a girl in the one bedroom and there's a dude downstairs. So they went and rounded them up and got them all in, crammed into Jason's bedroom. Um, in her testimony, HG recalled, quote, we were told to take off all of our clothes, end quote. The brothers also asked if any of the five victims had any money, and they replied with, you know, take our money, take whatever you want. Trigger warning is now, because we're going to get into the, some of the really brutal stuff. Um, I don't know why they lost their focus on the money, but uh, this is when it changed. They, the brothers forced all five into the bedroom closet, ordering them not to talk, intimidating them by brandishing their guns and yelling, shut the fuck up, if they heard them even whispering. That's so tough. Such tough boys. Right. Uh, Reginald and Jonathan rotated between taking the men out of the closet and beating them with golf clubs. Um, sexually assaulting the females and then also forcing the victims to have sex with each other while the brothers watched um, including making HG and Heather sexually assault each other mm. orally and with their fingers um, they started to make Jason have sex with HG but then stopped when they realized they were actually boyfriend girlfriend so they didn't even want not that they would have been having a good time, but they're like, no. Then they made um, Aaron, or tried to make Aaron have sex with HG, but Aaron was the one studying for the priesthood, so he was super adamantly trying to refuse. Right. Um, one of the brothers hit him in the back of the head with the butt end of the pistol. Um, they kind of even did like a countdown, because he... He refused, but he also was not getting an erection, so they were oh, trying yeah. to give I him mean, a countdown threat of, you know, if you don't do this, I don't, they didn't really give, like, a what they were going to do, but the countdown came and went, and they didn't, besides beating them more, they didn't do anything else at this moment. Because that's going to help. Right, I know. Um, yeah, he got beat more with the golf club when he didn't get an erection. They swapped Aaron and HG out for Jason and Heather, having Jason have sex with Heather. 
and then Bradley have sex with Heather. HG said through the closet door she could hear Heather crying out in pain because they took them out of like the room into the hallway. I, I, not that it would have been nice to just do it on the bed, but it was right there. I don't understand. Like, whatever. I mean, I guess well, they're, they're, they're clearly, clearly not very smart. Yeah, they're terrible. Individuals. After that whole bout, they asked who had ATM cards. Reginald started taking the victims out one by one to ATMs using Jason's extended cab truck. While Reginald was out with the first of the five, who was Bradley, Jonathan took HG out again to rape her, put her back in the closet. Reginald returned with Bradley and traded him out for Jason, left. Apparently Bradley was silent when he returned to the closet and Aaron, the would-be priest, tried to conspire with him, saying like maybe they should resist mm -hmm. or, you know, try to do something. And apparently he was just dead silent. I don't know if they super intimidated him while they were out, but... Or something else happened that he just doesn't want to speak about because he's yeah. embarrassed and... Mind you, these guys are naked. When they're taking these guys out to these ATMs, they're still buck-ass naked. Oh, I didn't... Yeah. I didn't really think about that the whole time either, but yeah, they're, they're still naked. Um, when Reginald was out with Jason this time around, Jonathan took Heather back out for another assault. Reginald returned with Jason, and then HG volunteered to go to the ATM next. He let her put on a sweater, no bottoms, and let her know that he liked seeing her with no underwear. Fucking disgusting. He forced her to drive to the bank while he was crouched in the back seat. That's why I said extended cab truck. It didn't say that in my research, but that only makes sense because you can't have a backseat in a truck unless you're extended cab. Um, HG later recounted that she asked, quote, are you going to hurt us? And he, and his reply was no. And then she asked, quote, do you promise you're not going to kill us? To which he replied, yes. Um, on the way back to the house, after, after getting HG's money, Reginald had the balls to say he wished they would have met under different circumstances because she was cute and they probably would have hit it off. Yeah. In your wildest dreams, buddy. Like, what? No. Like, just, no. I'm sorry. You, you can't rape someone multiple times and they're like, oh yeah, I wish we met you know, different circumstances. No. no. Clearly you're a shitbag, so <laughs> no. Once they were in God. the house, he mm. raped her again. Reginald raped HG again, this time finishing in her mouth. So he must have just Kept really liked her. Yeah, really liked her so much. Jonathan also raped Heather again, and then HG one more time. Um, somewhere along this timeline, it didn't really specify, and I don't know if that was just a lot, obviously, for HG to deal with, but at some point, Reginald did take Heather and Aaron out to the ATMs as well. Um, took all five of them at their different points and got as much money out of their accounts as they could. This part's heartbreaking. I mean, it's all heartbreaking. Um, when they were done with all the ATM trips, the, the brothers then ransacked the home looking for different money and valuables. And in a, a truly heartbreaking find, they discovered concealed in a coffee can was an engagement ring. That's Aww. for you, Jason told HG. I was going to ask you to marry me. Aww. He had planned on proposing to HG the following Friday, December 22nd, or I did see Christmas Eve was listed in another thing, but still. Well, I'm sure they took that because that's worth money. Oh, yeah, they did. And Jonathan specifically pocketed it. Which one liked HG? Maybe he can use it to propose. Reg Reginald. After all of that was said and done, they forced the whole group outside into the snowy weather. Recorded as low as 17.6 degrees at midnight that night. Because remember, this it's is December. Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. Christmas time, basically. All three male victims still naked and the females only having a sweater or sweatshirt on. So they let Heather put a shirt on as well when they were doing their ATM stuff. They were forced to walk barefoot through the snow to Aaron's Honda Accord. 
They tried to cram all five of them into the trunk together. I mean, that would be some serious human Tetris, but I, I, whatever. Um, they realized that would not work, so they did manage to cram all three men in the trunk. And then Heather sat in the like passenger compartment of the car with Jonathan, while Reginald made HG join him in Jason's truck, and they both drove the vehicles to a remote soccer field. When they were in the car, HG noted that the time was 2.07 a.m. So they had been dealing with this for three hours. Oh, man. Which, even ugh, the description of reading through all the research and stuff, it just seemed like it would be even longer than that. But uh, I can't even imagine. And I bet it felt like never-ending. Yeah. Once a... Once at the soccer field, the Carr brothers made all five victims line up side by side, turn away, and kneel in the snow. Jason and HG went side by side, and the former couple of Heather and Aaron also went side by side. Not sure if Bradley was in the middle on the end, doesn't matter. Um, as HG was kneeling, she heard the first gunshot go off. Uh, she recalled that Aaron, she could hear Aaron pleading, please, no sir, please. And she heard the second shot go off. They shot each of the five execution style in the back of the head, including HG. She remembers seeing like white stars, but she didn't go unconscious nor fall over. She was still kneeling. Uh, one of the brothers kicked her in the back to make her fall forward in the snow where she just laid still, faking death, to avoid being shot again. Did it kill her? It didn't kill her. You want to know what saved her life? A fucking metal barrette in the back of her hair. It deflected no the bullet shit. enough that she didn't get, oh my like, God. murked. Yeah. A metal barrette. So I mean, it, it like, still, like, grazed her or whatever. But it didn't go it in? It didn't, no. It deflected in our... Maybe it didn't even graze her. Maybe... I don't know. But it... They clearly wow. had to have seen some sort of blood or wound or something, because they would have probably just shot her more, if not, but... But I don't think they're that smart to even no, look for that at this not. point. Like, I don't... Yeah. Yeah. Fucking Barrett, dude. And, so you know, 2000... Well, it was survived. probably one of them snappy ones. Yep. You know what I mean? That's exactly... I'm hand motions right now, but... What I'm picturing in my head as well is... Those snappy or one, one of those other. I'm thinking either this one, or this, and you know yep. what I mean. So she's the only one. She's the she's the obviously only one. But he said he wasn't going to kill any of them. I know them fuckers. They lied to her. Of course they always lie. And and he like the dog is still so at. Well, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Well, he's jumping ahead of me. I think of the animals. <laughs> so she's faking being dead because she didn't want to get shot again. Uh, Reginald and Jonathan got in Jason's truck, drove over them, like drove over their bodies. HG remembered even being run over as well. Oh my god. And took off. Uh, lying half naked on the snow covered ground, she waited until she could no longer hear the pickup. And then she got up to check on her friends. And as she checked on her would be fiance, she, she thought she heard Jason let out a slight moan. I don't know if that was, like, wishful thinking yeah. or if he really did. Oh, head wounds can be tricky. Um, she saw he was bleeding, obviously, from the wound and from his eyes. Uh, she took off her sweater, the one thing she was wearing, and tried, like, wrapped it around his head to try to help stop the bleeding. Uh, she saw Christmas lights off in the distance. So brave, naked, and bleeding, she crossed more than a mile in the freezing cold oh and God. snow including across a construction site, around a pond, and through some brush before she reached the house with the Christmas lights. Which, thank God they didn't have a timer, because this was, you know, between, it's probably 2.30 in the morning by now. Yeah. Most people nowadays have timers, so that shit would have yeah. been off and she wouldn't have been able to see anything. She rang the bell and knocked on the door frantically and relentlessly until she woke the sleeping couple inside. She begged for their help, explaining, we've all been shot, three of my friends are dead. Because that's when she thought Jason was still alive. Um, the couple let her inside, wrapped her in blankets to keep her, 
to cover her and, and warm yeah. her up. Um, she refused to let them call 911 because she insisted that they listen to her tell the whole story because she didn't think she was going to make it. So she wanted them to know what happened so they could get it reported. So yeah, she described all the horrible things that went on that night to the couple, which I'm sure they're just changed forever. And it's, what, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, probably, and... I'm like, trying to comprehend uh, being awakened and, like... You're this, still... This naked woman telling you, you know, like, Jesus. Wow. How, how would you even process that? Like, I mean... Right. She's just went through that. How would she process that? But I'm just... It's like, the, the bravery right right and the wherewithal that she's got is, like, I mean, awesome, but uh, she wanted someone to know what happened so hopefully justice could be carried out for her friends once she was satisfied that the couple had you know the information well enough to pass along she allowed them to call the police and then still not knowing if she was gonna live or not she asked them to call her mother and quote tell her i love her mm. and to also call jason's parents um and I, she reported that she was also worried about her students since she was a teacher. She was worried who was going to take care of them now. Oh, Right? She was also run over, and she made it that far. Did she have broken bones? Um, it didn't say, but... In a truck? Being run over by a truck? But if they're side... Mm, hear me out. If they're side by side, like, it would displace... Okay. You know what I mean? Like... And they're probably not, I mean, obviously they're not the smartest. Yeah, they're definitely not the smartest. But oh. she did report that she she felt it. I don't know if yeah. it was like over legs or what. Luckily it wasn't oh, over heads, she says. Police arrived and briefly questioned HG before she was taken to the hospital by paramedics. From the description HG gave of Jason's truck, police were able to get the license plate number from the registration information um, and put out an alert in the early morning hours. So by dawn, the news stations were already broadcasting the plate number and description of the truck, as well as descriptions of the suspects. And these two idiots are probably like, who, who, who told? Like, because they, they thought they killed all. Right, they, they literally thought they killed them all. Because hmm. my next sentence, in the meantime, after they left the group for dead, thinking that they took care, quote, took care of it all, uh, they went back to the house. And they weren't done with their evil. Here's the other trigger. They killed Nikki. It didn't say anything about any torture. It just said that they did find the schnauzer in a pool of blood. Why? Why like, Why did they need to go back and kill the dog? Like, literally no point in killing the dog. Besides that they're fucking assholes. Uh, but then they loaded up a big screen TV, some appliances, bedding, china, and of course that engagement ring. And anything else they thought was I valuable. I hate them. I hate them. Right. Uh, luckily, after a neighbor noticed that particular truck in his own apartment parking lot, and another neighbor actually helped Reginald carry the TV up to his apart like room in this so apartment neighbors complex. neighbors of them. Yes, of these the, idiots. The brothers. Okay. Neighbors of the brothers. By 7.30 a.m., both of these neighbors called it in to report what they saw. Who? You're going to haul a big-ass TV up to your fucking room at, like, 6 o'clock in the morning? Doesn't that seem weird? A little uh, bit. That's sus. You know? As the kids say it these days. Sus. Suspish. <laughs> Be Syrian. <laughs> but, yeah, I hate them. Uh, police swiftly sealed off the area around the apartment building, and two officers went up to the apartment and knocked on the door. Finally, a woman named Stephanie opened the door, who was Reginald's girlfriend and also lived in this apartment. Oh, but he... Okay. But he liked HG so... Right, I know. I mean, there's lots fucked with this, but... Um, other officers apprehended Reginald as he was trying to slip out a window of the apartment. Idiot. Then there were mixed reports I found of how the police came to where Jonathan was, but shortly after noon... In a different part of town, police arrived at Jonathan's girlfriend's place, where he was indeed found. Um, he tried to flee when he saw the police, but got caught after a short chase. He still had Jason's engagement ring intended for HG in his pocket, 
when he was taken into custody. Less than 12 hours after the multiple murders, Reginald and Jonathan Carr were both in custody. Which is a hell of a turnaround. Like, yeah. I'm glad they're fucking stupid because, you know, Thank obviously. Thank God that for that barrette. barrette. Thank that barrette. God for that barrette because. I would never lose the, that barrette. That would be good luck charm for real. Andrew Schreiber recognized the pair as his assailants when he saw them on the news. Okay. And contacted authorities. And as I previously mentioned, Linda Walenta was able to identify them from a lineup before she passed away from the wounds sustained sustained in her attempted carjacking. Um, a highway worker found a black 380 caliber semi-automatic handgun along the highway near the soccer field where they had taken the five friends to execute. Um, it was confirmed by the Kansas State Crime Lab that it was indeed the weapon used to shoot Linda, each five of the friends, and to shoot out the tires of Andrew's car. September 9th of 2002, jury selection for the Carr Brothers trial began at the Sedgwick County Courthouse and concluded on Wednesday, October 2nd. So about a month. Wow. Um, Jonathan Carr's attorneys tried to have him declared unfit to stand trial, because of course, um, but the presiding judge reviewed the reports and ruled him competent. The trial began on Monday, October 7th with an obvious mountain of evidence against them. Reenactments and testimonies showed the jury just how brutal and depraved the crimes were. One 51-year-old juror even fainted while listening to a trauma surgeon uh, describe the shooting and the injuries of Linda Walenta. I mean, if I was going to faint, I was probably going to faint with all the other stuff. But, right. You know, whatever. Uh, had to be taken to the hospital to be examined, uh, checked out. Um, and just four weeks to the day after the trial began, the jury returned verdicts of guilty for most of the staggering 113 charges against the Carr brothers, which ranged from first-degree murder, kidnapping, rape, robbery, and animal cruelty. And finally, Reginald and Jonathan Carr were sentenced to death on Friday, November 15th. That's right. But, as... Everyone knows the death penalty is... Takes four. Well, and it's like appeals, and sometimes they get rid of it, and... Right, I, I believe right now it's just been vacated to a life in prison. Um, but they are now currently sitting on death row in Kansas' El Dorado Correctional Facility. Heather Muller's mother was quoted as saying, Heather would want us to pray for her murderers, as Heather was probably praying for them at the moment of her death. Because mm -hmm. she was the one that was going to be a nun. Yeah. Uh, Heather was a preschool teacher at St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic School, and every year the school awards a deserving 8th grade student the Heather Muller Love of Faith Award. Mm -hmm. Right? One happy thing out of this story, and I saw this in a couple sources... H.G. and Andrew Schreiber became friendly during the trial. They dated and then married in 2004. Oh. I know. And she had nothing, like, there was, that bullet to her head didn't cause any life-altering, like. No, I didn't get anything. Good. About that, yeah. She's Ladies. super lucky. Get your barrettes. Wear metal barrettes. That's crazy. Uh, I'm just still, like, in shock over right. that. It was just so strange they went from trying to rob rob people, wanting a SUV to rob people, and then, like, oh, let's just rape the absolute shit out of these people and make them rape then, their friends. And then execute them. In a way, it's sad. They were only 22 and 20 at the time that they lost the rest of their life. I mean, it's fair, I guess. I didn't look into if they're still married I mean, because everything was pretty much HG, HG, and one spot I saw her real first name, but I didn't want to, like, delve into that. I also want to just hope that they're still married and happy. Yeah. I'll just leave it at that. That was my, my first story. You guys can comment. You can check out our website, hometownhomicide.com. 
again, we want to tell stories to you, not about you. So stay safe. And this has been Hometown Homicide.